Hey guys, thanks for watching. In this video, we're going to be going over the week 8 concepts for Physics 111. So starting off with simple machines, we see that these are devices used to increase or decrease the effect of an applied force at the expense of a change in the distance of applied force. So they're not going to do work for us, but they're going to make our work easier. And these would include inclined planes, pulleys, levers, wheel and axles, jack screws, and wedges. And we see on this image on the right, a woman is using a simple machine, and more specifically, this would be a lever system, uh, in order to lift this heavy rock. And normally, it would require a force of 3F to lift the rock. However, she only has to apply a third of that force. Um, but we know that this comes at an expense, so even though we have less of an applied force, we have to apply this smaller force for a greater distance. So the rock is only being lifted a distance of D. However, the woman has to apply the force for three times that distance. And this brings us into mechanical advantage, which is the ratio of the output force and the input force. And for ideal machines, our work input is going to be equal to our work output. And by ideal, we mean machines where we don't have any outside forces besides our applied force acting on the system. Uh, for instance, no friction. And we know that this isn't really going to be the case very often, but it's still important to realize that we have these relationships. For instance, our output force over our input force is going to be equal to our input distance over our output distance, which is basically what we saw in this example above. And then next we'll be talking about power, which is the rate at which work is done. So power is equal to work over time, and we know that work is equal to our force times our cosine theta times delta x. So this is going to give us units of joules per second, which we call watts. And we can also use um, this simpler equation here when we're dealing with average speeds or instantaneous speeds. And basically it was just derived from delta x over t. We know that's equal to velocity. We just have to remember when we input our average speed, we're going to get out an average power. And if we input an instantaneous speed, it's going to give us the power for that instance. All right, next we're going to be talking about momentum, which is basically moving mass. So we see that momentum, or P, is going to be equal to our mass times our velocity, which is going to give us units of kilogram meters per second. And when we're dealing with impulse, we want to know how much force we applied and for how long we applied that force. So sometimes we denote impulse as J, and it's going to be equal to the force times our change in time. And this is going to give us units of newton seconds. So what's important to realize between impulse and momentum is that even though we technically have the same unit of kilogram meters per second, we only want to use this newton seconds unit when we're dealing with impulse, not when we're dealing with momentum. So let's just go through the example below, which says, find the impulse of a bat hitting a baseball with a force of 320 newtons for 0.02 seconds. So we know that our impulse is going to be equal to our force times our change in time. So here, our force is 320 newtons. And our change in time is going to be 0.02 seconds. So when we multiply these together, we're going to get an impulse of about 6 newton seconds. All right, now let's talk about the impulse momentum theorem, which states that impulse is equal to the change in momentum. So we see that our force times our change in time it's going to be equal to our change in momentum. And it's important to realize that we're talking about the change in momentum here, not the actual momentum. And it's also important to realize that when we're dealing with impulse, we're not talking about impact. So when do we use work energy theorem versus the impulse momentum theorem? Basically, this always depends upon the problem we're dealing with. So if we're given a distance and a force in the problem, we're going to want to use work energy and if we're given a force and a time, we're going to want to use our impulse momentum theorem. All right, lastly, we're going to be talking about the law of conservation of momentum, which states that in an isolated system, the total momentum is conserved. So we see here on the image on the right, uh, we have a red car that's about to collide with a white car. Uh, and basically what we're supposed to realize is that before the collision, we have a certain total mass for the system and a certain total velocity. And then after the collision, the velocities and even the masses may have changed, but the total mass for the system and the total velocity for the system will still be the same. So therefore, whatever our initial momentum was for the system is going to be the same after the collision.
So next we'll be talking about the different types of collisions. And first off, we have an elastic collision in which kinetic energy is conserved. And in an inelastic collision, kinetic energy is not conserved. And then we also have this special case called a complete inelastic collision or sticky collision. And in this case, our final kinetic energy will be equal to zero. So that's what we have in this first example here. We have two objects that have the same mass and the same velocity moving towards each other. And after they collide, basically their velocities are gonna cancel out. So we have a velocity equal to zero. And notice how they kind of seem like they stick together, which is why we call it a sticky collision. And since we have this velocity equal to zero, our final kinetic energy for the system will also be equal to zero. So therefore, in this case, our kinetic energy was not conserved. And then lastly, we have this example uh, where we have two objects with different masses moving in the same direction, and they're going to collide. And basically, here we see that um, one of the objects even changed directions. However, what's important to realize is that this is an elastic collision, so our masses were conserved, and we also know that our velocity is going to be conserved. Therefore, uh, we can denote that our kinetic energy is also conserved, which we see here. Alright, that's all for this video, guys. Thanks for watching.